So, first of all, I think everybody's met me here already, so I don't have to tell who I am and where I'm from and all these sort of things. Um, I had this lecture actually prepared for the first day I was here, so trying to uh, help you to avoid the most common pitfalls, but as I didn't have my lecture, I see how happily you managed to step to into every possible hole that was possible. So. What I kind of today tried to quickly change with my lecture just to cover more what we actually did here and what could have been done and how to finish what we already started. Um, how many of you actually shot in 3D? Okay, have any of you seen some of the stuff that you ended up shooting? Were you happy with it? Of course. Well, did, did you see? It? Did you see it on cinema here, or did you see it on screen upstairs, or well, how did you see it? Where did you see it? The stuff that you shot. On this screen, for example. Okay, I shot already something on 3D and saw it in this screen. But this was not my f first 3D ever. The first three was awful. All right. So, but Probably. what cameras did you use to shoot it? Um, very bad choice for the 3D means uh, 5D cannons. But the one that you did here? Yes. With Canon 5Ds. All right. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just going to tell you this. If you have unsynced cameras, don't use them for 3D, please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's just nothing you can do really to fix them properly. I understand there are some positions that it's just necessary to do the necessary evil, but I really don't want to teach how to do it. So anybody else who shot 3D here? What cameras did you use? Canon FX. Alright, this, this at least I, ha I got one sample file today, so I can actually show how it goes through the editing and hopefully we make at least a DCP or a Blu-ray master out of just one single file. So we would be fast to render, but at least you could see the process from the beginning. I'll just write this down. Actually, I I got the Canon footage. Then, of course, I had this I 2K footage because it's my camera, right? And then the last thing I have is Sony DD10. That was also used uh, quite a lot here for shooting various stuff. I'm going to put all these three camera shots into one single timeline so we can see them on the single timeline, what we can do, how we could do it, and what would be possible. So, um, when you were shooting this with these cameras, is uh, you shot with Canon, right? Yeah. What was the frame rate you shot at? Um, but I wasn't shooting it here. It okay, it doesn't really matter. Uh, 25p. 25p. And 50p. It goes up to 50p. Nice. Yeah. All right. And the footage that I got from here is 25i. So this is actually what I got, and I can tell you a little bit how to deal with this stuff. Uh, the footage I have this time from here is, I think it's 23976, but it could be also possible 24 and 25 and 29976. So here I have this. And the DD10 is only 25i, and there's nothing really you can do about it. So, once we know what we can shot, really, with the, with the cameras, uh, we have a little bit of choices. With Canon camera, we usually want to use them in a mirror rig, but we can shoot all of them side by side. There are some cameras that are only lens converted, and like when we shoot these things, uh, what would be, for example, what would be the advantage of using the DD10, what's actually just side-by-side -side camera with this rather small interocular, but not really small enough for big screen work, is that it would never have any sort of polarization artifacts nor color sync issues. This would make these things like in post-production much easier to deal with than these cameras when we shoot them through the rig. 
because we have lots of polarization problems to deal with. And uh, we are talking about uh, post-production on a budget, so that means we cannot afford Ocula or what was the Ion Fusion's 3D tools called? Dimension, I think. These are the most common tools that I know that could actually deal with this. Mystica can deal, deal with this within limits, but it's a real-time tool then again. If somebody knows any other tool that could deal, do this, please help me out. So let's say you get the stuff done, you get it edited. Where do you guys edit? Sony Vegas. Vegas, okay. That's an interesting <laughs> choice. Anything else? Final Cut and Ali. Uh, I, I now must ask which Final Cut? Uh, not the 10. <laughs> okay, so it's a Final Cut 7. seven yeah. I, mean, I have very bad news for you guys. Uh, I usually do these things in Premiere, so I will be showing it in Premiere. But the same workflow should work, should work within Avid. I haven't used Avid in myself so about 10 years already. I couldn't learn it, I'm sorry. It's just something wrong with my brain. But it should work. It definitely works in Final Cut 7, but it's sometimes slow and real-time performance is what it is. Uh, and Sony Vegas does work within certain limits. Like we I usually had good success with it, but in here, one group is actually trying to edit Vegas within Cineform and just one eye doesn't show up. And on my computer it works fine, on their computer it doesn't work, so I really cannot recommend this as a workflow. So Premiere Pro as well. So how do I usually deal with all this is that uh, whatever format this come in, I make this into Cineform files. Have you any of you have any experience with Cineform? Nice experience? Yeah. <laughs> what? This is the thing with um, low-end tools is that they tend to crash a lot on you, especially when you're working on a deadline. And even the highest end Cineform costs $1,000 right now. I would still consider it as a low-end tool because most of the time it just crashes on you. But then again, I would figure that this is the only choice in reality that we have if you actually want to take the stereo workflow through. Like from the beginning to the end, stay in stereo. There is an alternative. The alternative is this, that you first take just left eye, edit the left eye on any program you like, and then when you start to confirm, you just redo the edit on a second layer with the right eye, and then take it into master. It's a very, how should I say, what good word, anal thing to do. <laughs> but uh, these are the two choices we really have. If you want something better, the option would be, for example, uh, out of the smoke. But right now, it's still costing, I think, somewhere around $10,000 just for the software. They're dropping their price, but hopefully be available in uh, end of the year. So, and there would be a huge problem, for example, because it will never support files like what come out of the 10 <coughs> So even with the highest end tools, if you could mix and match all these cameras, we would still not be able to do it in any specific program, not even on Quanta. Uh, so one way is this, that we take all of these, take it to Cineform, or we just edit two lines. So once we get it edited, we come to the, actually the most important question, how do we master this? Where, do, where does our 3D content end up? So whenever you were doing 3D, what actually, how did you screen it? What was the format? What was it? Uh, you mean an agrif or something No, like that? I mean the container. Was it just a file that was dropped in somewhere? Uh, those two files in stereoscopic player. Okay, so stereoscopic player. <coughs> Anything else that you mastered to? Do what? Nvidia. Nvidia. So it's pretty much the same. It's just two streams or single stream. Two, two streams. So two video. Uh, well, DCP. in my excuse me. TCP. TCP. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. Usually, TCP and the Blu-ray would be the two things that at least I end up doing my work on. 
There is the last one, but not the least, is the YouTube getting popular. YouTube. So there are. I don't think the stereoscopic player actually gives you any uh, limitations technically about frame rates, but there's a little problem with this: is that 24 only, and that means 24 zero zero and nothing else for any sort of TCP work. And because our friends, technology makers, always try to make things so simple for us, then Blu-ray. Almost the same, but not exactly the same. Um, well, the frame rate issue is one thing. My recommendation is to change the playback duration, meaning keep the frames intact, but three times the sound. If there are any sound recordings here, they probably hit me with a boom. But uh, it's still much better compromised than actually doing the opposite. Meaning, when we start blending frames in 3D, when we literally have tons of problems with ghosting when we project things, and when the original image already has ghosting on it, it looks horrible. Nobody really wants to see this. So please, whenever you try to do this, always try to keep the frames intact. YouTube, I don't think, also makes any frame rate limitations, does it? I don't think so. Yes, but with this we get to another thing. Uh, YouTube, I think, takes full frame side by side and also scale side by side. Am I correct? Yeah. But let's talk about scale side by side, because this can be used with television sets as well, within players, within even stereoscopic player. And this is now the thing with uh, with nice technology again, is that uh, act for active televisions, if you use scaling or any sort, it doesn't really matter. But when you're using a passive television like LG makes, then the thing is this, that every other line is shown. So if you use side by side, you use both ways half of the resolution. If you would have full frames, you use only <coughs> one way the half of the resolution. So actually, if you would use an LG television over and under, and you would lose nothing. But YouTube does not support the over and under. <laughs> so we get down to this that where do we get with this is simple that actually when we look at where we need to really get in the end, there really is no standardization anywhere. So this is the most important place where you start when you go into pre-production. You figure out what do you need to do with this file. Based on this, you find the camera what you want to work with, and there you actually select the frame rate that you can, as close as possible to your final frame rate. The, the further you get from the final frame rate, the harder it is to convert even the sound to actually sound in the end decent. Because if you shoot 29.97 and need to end up with 24 frames a second, well, everybody's going to be sounding very low. And actually, all the production here I've seen, everybody's been shooting 25 frames a second, so I still have no idea why they're doing this. I'm guessing that the camera was just set up like this. So, but fear not. It's actually possible to make the 25 into 23976 or 24 or whatever we choose to, and I will show you in a moment like how I would do this. There's one more thing I want to talk about technically, and then I will actually show what I'm doing. Is this that uh, this 25i and 25i? Because uh, I think all the possible ways to show 3D are actually non interlaced. Am I correct? Does anybody know any way to show in 3D in interlaced mode? I think that I tried it out with the Sony DD10 and uh, connected straight to 3D television. It actually looks kind of progressive and very fast, so I'm actually thinking that it does show it in interlaced mode, so maybe like a 50p scaled. But it is most definitely not the 25 frames and the interlaced. So there might be some uh, ways to get around this, but I don't know that officially there is a standard how to do it. And most definitely there isn't any file format how to do it. The stuff that I got from Canon was from the Key Pro recorder, so it's uh, ProRes codec, right? So, 
silicon imaging goes straight to Synapse form. And DD10 is, uh, it's the all famous multi-view. Uh, how do, now I would like to get all of them to Synapse form. So the progress needs to be encoded into Synapse form first. Then it needs to be muxed in Synapse form. To a 3D file. So it's synced and it stays as one file. So within, whenever we go to editing, when we just swip, swap between eyes, or we can use it viewing mode that actually we don't have to anymore manage two eyes. This would be the entire idea to use Synapse form. Sometimes it works, at least, I hope. Uh, with MVC, you can directly go to Synapse form 3D. but only on Windows PC. <coughs> there is absolutely no way to decode multi-view content on a Mac, on any OS X system. I don't know why. So, once we're here, all these files are in Cinef4. Excuse me, which software would you use to go from? Cinef4. From prior to Cinef4. Uh, it's Cineform itself. It has a, it has Cineform Studio that I tried today. What in theory should do this, but on my computer it failed badly. But I'll just show you. So uh, there's also a program called HDLink that comes with it. At least this did the job. So first I get just two streams of Cineform. Then I go to First Light, try to find the syncing point. Then I mix it together, and then I'm ready to go to Premiere. Now, because all this would stay in native format, so this is 25i, this is 23.976, and this is also 25i. Then my workflow for this is, uh, uh, I, you need to deinterlace this to use it or slow it down and still deinterlace it. For my sample today, I'm just going to deinterlace it because otherwise it will take another hour just to show these things. So what I do now is in Premiere Pro, I change the frame rate and I do the day interlacing and render this file out again for faster editing. In here, we do the same thing. So by the time we actually get here, now we are 23, 9, 7, 6, all over the place. Why I'm choosing to do things at 23, 9, 7, 6 is because it's commonly used video format. So if you need to do dailies in standard definition, for example, you can actually do a DVD with two, two to three pull down. You can do Blu-ray just from one eye for two eyes. You can do all files. Everything would be actually uh, like industry standard compatible. In 24.00, you can only have files. There is no video signal that actually runs at 24.00. Um, once we get this done, should edit. Uh, render per eye. If you have some finishing options, like uh, I use myself speed grade a lot, then you can, when you have done the rendering, you can export the EDL. If you have one eye and the other eye, you can bring it in there to color grading, to uh, keyframing on parallax. All basic 3D, uh, 3D matching, also basic 3D matching in color. So that's what I usually do. If you don't have the budget, you can try out the first light workflow, but I really do not recommend because it's very hard to keep track what, where the blacks and where the highlights are going because the scopes are not that exact. One image, what you see in the first light application is totally different when you watch it in Premiere Pro, when it's on your light output, it's even third. So it's really not a viable solution. Either use a speed grade or spend the thousand dollars and uh, get the Da Vinci. You could use the da, da Vinci Light, but this not does not support 3D. Otherwise, if you're ending up in HD, you want to do one eye at a time, and you're willing to go through the paint, then you can skip the thousand dollars. If you can afford it, I would really recommend it because Da Vinci is also has quite decent tools about it, and it doesn't cost arm and leg, so it ends up to be at least a decent product. What you're finishing. Once you have done, render all this out. 
you have option to make a DCP. Blu-ray or video. Well, DCP actually, we would still go back to Premiere Pro and I do this in Audition, it's for rescaling of the audio. So I'll show you how this works. So first we have to convert it in Premiere Pro and then only cheap tool that I know to make um, 3D Blu-rays, sorry, I wrote it in the wrong line, is Vegas. So Blu-ray, for the Blu-ray we do the master files, then we put them into Vegas and from there on we can actually make a Blu-ray that works on some players it turns out. Because Sony advertises this as fully compatible Blu-ray, but I have these Blu-rays failed many times on Panasonic players while they work fine on Sony players. The higher end tools probably do a good job, but on Vegas we are talking about, I think it's $600 on NetBlender or I think it's, what was it, Blu-ray Architect or something like this. We're talking about from twenty-five dollars to $50,000 for the mastering application. So it's easier just to find off the internet somebody who offers the service, give them the source files and they will deal with the mess. So if you don't mind, I'll just show you roughly how to go through this page. So here are the files from what we get to start from the cheaper end. Hello. Well it's Windows you know. So this is what you get from the um, from the camera. To convert this, all right, we go to settings. Uh, I have this saved but uh, originally it shows up like this which is actually incorrect, then you have to put it to interlace. Uh, file format, you can choose either AVI or MOB. If I try AVI on this computer, it will just crash. So try whichever one works for you and keep with this. And medium quality for these sort of cameras is fine. Uh, there isn't an option to the interlace here, hopefully. Ah. And please do not check the day interlace because it will blend frames from both interlaced fields, meaning that you will get double edges on anything. For some reason, Cineform still hasn't figured out how to do property interlacing, so we will have to do it in a separate pass in Premiere Pro. So, okay. Add mm. click the conversion list and... Well, it's a short file, so it goes fast. Okay, well, this is doing, we can go back and actually check out the Canon files. From Canon, originally, I had these two files. If I try to pull them in here, they just won't come. It, by, if you look through the documentation, it says it supports all sorts of QuickTime files, but this just doesn't show up, so I don't know what's going on. All right, so Cineform has a one nice legacy tool that the UI is very pleasant and you know exactly what it's doing. Select the files. So we have this and original file. What's this? here in preferences uh, again quick time because Avi doesn't work for some reason for me uh, we don't change anything in here because the frame rate change I don't really know how it works and I don't trust this quality high is enough and make sure you have the frame format interlaced because automatically it sets it as progressive which it shouldn't do I will not show how this converts because this takes about 15 minutes so I think we have better things to do than the flaw. And why have you chosen interlaced with Canon since it shots? Because these shots were already made here by students, so uh -huh. nobody really asked me. But I think it was actual reason was rather simple. It was to do the slowdowns. Mm -hmm. Okay, convert. 
Ah, there's one more step that we have to do first. So we put them into first light. For the Canon footage, because the rest of these two footages now are actually MOOCs files, meaning that there's one file for two eyes. But... But Canon are a good friend. So the files came in like this. Anjay may be in the back and tell which one is actually left. The, the straight one, no? Left channel is flipped. Left channel is flipped. So, this is flipped. Alright, so we set this to left eye. We set this one to right eye. And we go find the sinking position. Alright, there we go. In here we see interlaced. Because this is possible. Yeah. So, set it. So, it's 160. So, there's one frame difference. Just to be on the safe side of life. You can actually flip the horizontal and watch it against to make sure the eyes are the right way. Once you have this done, you have to mux these files. Add the Q. So it's exactly not rocket fast. <laughs> so once we do actually finish this, we can go to Premiere. Let this be added. I'll clean this mess up. So in here, I would actually do the frame rate change and the interlacing. Because I still want to keep it at stereo, I would use the stereo Cinephone <coughs> preset because this would render out the full stereo file. Every other way, when we would do it, we have to do one eye at a time and mux it again. So if you want to do one thing three times in one go, you can go. Uh, and I'm using as the master informant 23976 and then ADP. So there we go, there's the sequence. Find the file for the DD10, we just did. So, let me see. That is an anaglyph, so we should see that the... Yeah, you can see that their eyes are a bit different, the anaglyph lines. There's a problem, it's, uh, it's frame blended because uh, the frame rate is different, 23976, 25. So changing frame rate in Premiere Pro works rather straightforward. Uh, if I just can write it, comma, or a dot. But when we look at here, it sees this as a progressive footage, but as we remember it was interlaced, so we need to make sure that it's interlaced. Because when we, in Premiere, when we put this to a progressive timeline, then it automatically tainted this by just using one field. Unless you have frame blend on here, then it blends both frames together. Once you have this done, you go export, media, Cinef for Mavi, we don't need audio here. High quality is fine, resolution is fine, and make sure to check the render 3D intermediate. That means it renders the both full eyes out. We put it to the D10, convert it. Let's just put slash or underscore one there. <coughs> so 
This actually does seem to work now. It doesn't seem to crash that lot. On a Mac, it still does crash quite a bit, but on Windows, it seems rather stable. But it's a good point there. Every time you want to export something from a Premiere, save it. Every time it starts to crash kind of weirdly, just overall Premiere, not only in CNF form, turn off the Mercury engine. You can at least edit them. Now, once this is done, we actually have 23976 footage that's actually uh, progressive and it doesn't have any coasting. We can just check this out when it's rendered. Let's see how far this got to. Well, it's still crunching away. So, let's see. It's finished. So, let me go import. So, this is the new footage. See that there is no blending artifacts as well, no double edges. And this is very important when we deal with 3D stuff. We never ever want to have these double edges because in projections we'll get them anyways. Alright, this is cleaned up. As clean as it's gonna get. Let's see how far this is. Still working. Funny thing is, we have to actually drop this back into, we save it here, here, <coughs> because if we watch it, that, you see, not very good, so left eye was flipped. If anybody's got anagraph glasses, can they check out if the left and the right eye is correct? Mm -hmm. I left it. <laughs> yeah, this seems correct. So, actually... At least for me, this seems correct. So afterwards, you can play me. I don't know what I'm doing. Thank you. Um, that's the warm. Something like this. So, and if we take the left and then take the right, and we pick for this as well. At least the color is getting closer, if not exactly there. Yeah. We can come back to this later. So, when the left and right eye actually are flipped the correct way, we can take this to Premiere now. Uh -huh. There you go. Let's delete this. We don't need it anymore. So Yes. You don't need to render those changes? No. They're metadata, meaning that they rendered real time. Mm. Now let's see this. This is a motion. Seems nice. So, modify interpret footage. It's 25, upper field first. So if this comes out no fields, then we have double edges. So this was correct, sorry, and this needs to be 23, 9, 7, 6. So once we have this done, we export this again 
something that would actually play back. Like when you have only single screen workflow, then you don't actually have to render in between here because it can render this real time in most of the uh, computers. But uh, this computer that I'm running here, it's actually a six core computer running about five gigahertz. It has 20 gigs of RAM and one of the fastest graphics card. And this computer cannot do real time if I keep these conversions on. The other funny thing is uh, that the Sony Vega supposedly, supposedly supports the Sony DD10, but for the life of me, I couldn't actually have, get the native files playing back in real time. They're always dropping frames. Yeah. So again, not only can you move by frame, but if you don't get real time playback, I have no idea how to edit this. So let's get this done. This was the Canon. Converted. As I've done it already once before. And make sure that this is on. So, and export. Uh, now we come back to this um, what I told you before that you have actually two choices. Just edit by one eye at a time or by making two, t two timelines. Even when you go, go through Cineform, you could still do this edit by one eye. And I really do recommend this because otherwise somebody has to go through all the footage, make sure that the parallax is set up properly, that the white balance is done properly, that the footage is at least bearable to watch. Because otherwise when you start to mess with this in editing, you, you spend not, not half of your time, but 90% of your time fixing the 3D, but not editing your film. Mm -hmm. Meaning that most of the time is actually lost on things that you don't need to be doing at the time. And it's, it doesn't add any value to the work that you do, because edit works as well as in 2D as in 3D. And the things that really need some help, you need to help them in post anyway, so it, doesn't, <laughs> it wouldn't matter even if you would edit it in 3D, you would just see it, it doesn't work re really well at that point, but you would still have to fix it later on, so it wouldn't give you any extra information. Myself, uh, I've edited about six 3D films. I've edited all of them in 2D and messed with the 3D afterwards. There are some clients that have done their own editing and have required that I would provide them with the files and then I've really, what I've literally done is what you would usually old times do as tell us in it, meaning that you go through all the footage, make sure that the color alignment is proper, the parallax is roughly there, then render out the footage for the specifications that they give you and then they deal with this and it's their problem. I, I don't know actually anybody who would edit in 3D because the reasons are rather obvious even just wearing the glasses, even if you have passive glasses, just watching from one screen to another, having the depth perception, it's really not comfortable by any meaning of the word. And as I told you before, I don't think there's really actually added as a value to edit in 3D. You just lose a lot of time for things that you didn't need to be doing at that same time. The only thing that you're risking with is, for example, by editing left eye, that when you were shooting in a mirror rig, for example, or even by side by side, but actually, let's say one, one of the lenses had some dirt on it and it becomes visible. And when you do the edit, you don't see this, then you really have to come back. This is the only thing that I, I've so far had, have had problems with, but I didn't notice before. Mm -hmm. If anybody else has any other problem that they've seen like this, then... The other thing is this, that uh, if, the, if it's shot on location really badly, it, the alignment wouldn't come up. But you usually try to do this beforehand because we're talking about things on budget. That means if you do, do your work properly on set, and even if you do mess up and you see this on set, just log it and so the editor knows not to use this shot. Only this way you actually end up saving money. Otherwise, when you start to play ping pong in a post-production, you spend much more money than doing it high-end in the first place. Now the really problematic part of this is that you would actually have to do this shot by shot. So if you have 100 shots, you would spend a day just setting this up and it would render throughout a few nights. So it's not fast and as I told you before, it is a bleeding edge and the edge is bleeding really badly. What we could do as a shortcut, for example, is uh, we had these Canon cameras. We could just take the left eye and edit this and after come back and uh, reconfirm the Cineform. But there's one problem, because usually the files are a bit different length. They start at different positions because they're just manually started and stopped recorders. That means 
that when we would try to reconform this, because when we mux the file, then the Cineform automatically cuts the file only to the size what's overlapping. So that would mean that the beginning of the file would be a bit shorter and it wouldn't actually sync up anymore. So this is why I would recommend at least mux the files before you start editing, because then it would you can go through the entire process and just switch between left and right die. Even do the grading and everything you need to do in first light, but it will match up. Otherwise, it would be, again, another level of manual work added on top of things. So a little bit of preparation can save you a long mile afterwards. Because then you really start to have to look frame by frame where your footage has been shifted. All right. Well, get used to this. You see this a lot in your life. Much more than you would like. <laughs> That's okay, because I use this project only for converting anyway, so life is sometimes good to me as well. Mm, boo -boo. Let's get back there. So let's put it down a little. I don't know how well the rest of the shots are prepared. Let's see. Okay, and here, the, oh, no lookup tables, nice, let's try to get one. Uh, I think I have the old ones here somewhere. The lookup tables on Silicon Imaging cameras are always in the same folder where you have recorded stuff. So you could actually... You can actually have crash system. Nice. Works like a charm, as I told you. When you have it, you have it. When you don't, you don't. we could uh, render this out and try to finish it. I just need my two hands for editing, otherwise it takes much longer than it has to. So the editing, was ra the editing is rather straightforward. Please do save a lot. Save your ass. <laughs> now, once you're done with this, my recommended workflow would be to export left and right eye separately. So what you can do is just go to Cineform Display Settings, go to left eye, and now you can only see the left eye. I will export this as JPEG sequence, uh, because I don't have a RAID here, but you could easily do this as uh, DPX or TIFF to have the best quality you can have. Uh, really, my my eyes. I have the there you go, thank you. 75 is usually enough. It was 1920. Export as a sequence, please check this, otherwise you will get just one file. And let's go to presentation, new folder. same thing again, but 
from the right time. This is the advantage of if you even work just with 2D is that uh, you can have the uh, you don't have to redo the timeline nor reconform any of the media because otherwise you you need either to rename media or starting to make EDLs and replace text in it just to get it done halfway automatically. So we export this. Yeah. file name I already forgot. From added. Again, make sure you have export as a sequence and the frame rate correct. If you just check export as a sequence, the frame rate is usually in default setting, not what your actual frame rate was, so be double sure to have a correct frame rate here. Now, I'm doing this in Premiere 5.5 because I was not allowed still to show the 6.0 by the contract that I made with Adobe, but it should be available, I think, in three days. So if you're a little bit patient, you will get it. And, but the other thing is this, but now with um, Adobe tools, what comes next is that uh, what used to be Irida Speedgrade comes as a Speedgrade CS6 now. It looks a bit different. But as I wasn't allowed to show you this, I, I will show you the old one. Show the workflow, how it goes. The workflow stays pretty much the same. It isn't exactly easy program, but for a 3D workflow, I really do recommend uh, taking the time to learn it because it can make things much faster. So we take this. First, we have to go to settings. Okay. Most of the things work only from desktop here, so but the newer version, the UI, is much more user friendly and all of these things do have a buttons at least. So where did we go? We had presentation, we had render, one we have left. Drop it onto the timeline. And here you have all the color grading tools plus the stereo panel. Uh, because they're, the files are na named left and right, it should automatically find which one is from where, and it's shown already here, right and left. If you have them not properly set up, then it shows up as a mono, and you can just drag and drop the proper uh, file to the proper place. So we can take away the desktop. Oh, sorry, I have it set up for double screen. Here's the footage shows up. So what do we have here? I think I, yeah, it's set up for in, interlaced. Put it back to red and cyan for this, but usually you can just put it on uh, the, any of the trading televisions because these tend to use an interlace, or you can use the NVIDIA page flip system to see your 3D. So here is the stuff that we just did, all 14 seconds of it showing up. So, but in here we still don't have editing places, and the, the si most simplest way is just to export an EDL file from Premiere. Uh, no audio as we don't have any. And we don't want any in our creating sessions anyway. Don't need any levels. Okay. Back to render. The EDL shows up, and if you just drag and drop onto this, it finds the editing places, and now all of these are separate shots again. So if we need to make any of the adjustments in 3D, you can do it shot by shot basis. 
so ones don't co come from another and as I told you before let's see if this works so it's fully capable color grader and actually in color grading it's really my favorite tool uh, we could try this here that um, we go and have the speed grade trying automatically match colors for these two shots so let's see how good we get it split screen I need my other hand again so you see that uh, the little white balance problem that we had before mm -hmm. we could say it's gone Uh, let's go back to the normal mode. Hmm, for some reason it went back to. In here it's red cyan and it came back to red cyan. Really not starting to push this a lot. Just getting. Let's open up the comma for this shot and pull in some shadows. just something that you do. Now, I'm not very certain how long this would take to render here because uh, speed grade is very good and fast for speed grade for any sort of grading work. Anything you can do here always stays real time. But once you're done grading, rendering does take a whole lot of time here. So let's go back to this nice desktop. Presentation, render, subform, do, subform, left, I usually like to name the files that I'm exporting also uh, with the I because it, it wouldn't be the first time that somebody messes up the eyes just because they wouldn't paying attention. So if you, if you label them always properly, you can be certain that throughout the workflow, whoever picks up the workflow in between can actually finish it properly. Otherwise, you, you're not going to be very happy if you just finished editing and then give it away and after color grading it comes out that they, somebody swapped the eyes just when they were mastering the DCP and now you're in cinema and watching it like this. Has happened many times so that's why I warn. I'm sorry I usually don't use Windows so finding uh, special characters is a problem for me. This is a very common way to actually mark the numbers with percentage, so percentage, if you start it with zero then afterwards and then a number, that means how many digits and D, that means the digits <laughs> so let's try to get it to JPEGs again and let's see if we do have it we don't so we go frame sequence we find JPEG, 75 is good Uh, and here we check which eye gets rendered. No proxy, all other things. This is would be if, it, if the output format is different than how it would be cropped. And this is for fast rendering one on, online or offline quality. But this only applies for raw cameras. So once we already started the JPEG, I think it would come exactly the same speed. So no. Oh, that's quite fast actually. You know, this is something that why I really have to learn Windows again because the same program 
runs on the row of six and it renders two frames a second. So left eye we have done. Let's make a new one. Right. Do not forget to change the name here as well. Until this point, I actually had time to check this out in Windows, but now I'm getting into dark waters myself because I haven't done this under Windows before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if it crashes on me, I'm going to be surprised. If we get back to Premiere, we could just check that everything comes up correctly. Presentation, render, uh, this is number one. Step number two, let's take just the left eye, go open, and I forgot one checkbox, let's go in, numbered stills is very important in this case. Now it comes up as 29976, it's whatever you have in Premiere settings, but don't worry, just go and do the same thing that we did before, that's 23976. And now we're just looking at the one eye just to make sure that everything rendered out properly. Very nice edit. <laughs> Anyhow, now what do I want to see first? How to make a Blu ray out of this or how to make a DCP out of this? DCP. Um, um, do you want to see how it's done on a free tool or on a, how it's done on a paid tool? Free, free tool I, ha I have downloaded and registered for, but not used ever before. Mm -hmm. But I was reading... The same one, you place logo. Uh, let me see where was it. Draw offer I use as a paid tool, but DCP builder, yeah. I don't use this one. Which one you use? Open DCP. Open DCP. Uh, Open DCP, I think, had the limit of having one reel. Yeah. In DCP Builder, you can have multiple reels. Mm -hmm. I would prefer to do it like this, that I would actually try to do one beforehand, before showing others how to do it, you know, to better, like teaching people to drive a car without doing it once before yourself. And I would right, right now show you how to do it on a Frau Offer tools. Okay. I use uh, offer demo well, Bravo for demo will give you this watermark. Yeah. But it's different it's like yes. Well, these are actually full tools that we have here, so we can try it out. But I found this to be one of the easiest tools that's actually out there, even with paid ones. And I can tell you a, a rather funny story about this being in Berlin, where we're doing test screenings for El Premio and also the Game of Forgotten Dreams. There were guys from Toilby and Christie there because this was very like bleeding edge equipment for them. And guess what were the Toilby guys using? Easy DCP. <laughs> they don't even use their own tools. You want to have the Riscovic, so doesn't really matter if you use interrupt or not, it's going to be 24 frames a second, no more. Um, there is already beta out by Fraunhofer that does 48 frames a second, but I don't know which server would actually support this. And of course, then you cannot do interrupt. When you guys live in Poland, I strongly recommend to have the interrupt on. Just a week ago, I was doing a test screening and in a cinema. There were uh, eight places where they could play DCP, and only two of them were STMP compatible, or else would play only interrupt and would just not open up the DCPs. So, do not push the edges too much if you have a choice, especially in 3D, and then you can be at least certain that it will open up somewhere. Uh, this 3D. What about, what do you think about uh New, uh, new 3D Hubbit? 
Yes. This is 38 for one 48. night. 48. Yes. For one night. Um, so they create another new standard? Oh, there will be many standards. TCP standard also in 2.0, they're going to have a 16 frames a second version for 2D for displaying archived films. So, I mean, options are okay. And in TCP, kind of a container way how it's been done, it's okay because actually in the mastering process you make the decision and the projectionist shouldn't be able to mess it up. All the people who were actually involved in the TCP work claim that it is like this. I have very opposite experience being a lot of times in the back, checking out the, what the projectionists are doing and there still is quite a bit of play, what they can do with color. Mm -hmm. But at least they cannot mess with frame rates. So even so if we add more standards that means in post-production some point this gets decided and so at least the knowledgeable people will make this decision if they make a bad decision i cannot help to be honest my personal experience is this i've seen even film this that were done in 48 frames a second it was what show scan i think it was called i've seen 48 frames a second 4k 8k even and i've seen the 3d at 48 frames and 24. I tell you this, technically 48 frames is much better. There's so, you really see it actually that four, even 4K doesn't make a whole lot of sense without 48 frames a second because you just see strobing a lot more, but not, not much more detail. But I just like 24 much more, personal opinion. In Estonian language, there's a saying, some like the mother, some like the daughter. So I think I'm on the mother's side this time. <laughs> Render, we have the left eye, lovely. Okay. Now, things that, as I told you, I would use interop. I would take the automatic builder boxing off if I'm very certain that I have the right resolution. In this case, we're mastering in HD, which isn't actually a TCP compatible frame format, yeah. but funny enough, all cinema support is just fine. Mm -hmm. If you would start actually to pillar box it, they would mess up the projection. So if you have actually full HD file and you don't want to crop the top and bottom and zoom a little bit, I would actually recommend keeping it in HD and most cinemas who are much better off than having a black box that then they cannot pro properly project it anymore. Uh, things to know about 3D is that there is kind of a standard for 3D subtitles as a metadata, but uh, I don't know any open tool or any tool that you can actually buy that would do it, this sort of files. I know that Toilby has done this and they do like uh, what Toilby themselves mastered, they send out TCPs that have metadata 3D subtitles, but it's not an open standard, so if you, send, if you try this file on Doremi server, it just won't work. So again, we at the low end of stuff, we never know where the stuff is getting projected. We cannot afford to have different masters for different servers. So if you need to have subtitles, burn them in. The other thing is this, don't try, if the subtitle metadata sometimes get messed up, so it gets, gets to the wrong depth, and this is the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Because if you have a depth conflict just by subtitles, the image is screwed, nobody sees 3D. Even just a part of the image is in depth conflict, but that you, your brain will not put it together anymore as 3D. Okay. I don't have any audio, so it complains a little bit that no sound. But if you actually want to be TCP standard exactly compatible, you would have to have at least empty soundtrack with exact same duration. Yes. But uh, I haven't actually found a server what would complain if you don't have a soundtrack. So I don't mind this. This 3D would be the composite. Uh, let's see, because I just installed these things. Let's make sure that everything is what it's supposed to be. This your image processing. Please check that this is always checked off, otherwise if you have JPEG 2 case encoded before, it will try to re-encode them and you lose a lot of uh, uh, 
a lot of quality on this. Alright, so this all seems good. Uh, we have this 3D content kind. usually how complicated it is when you have like uh, let's say language version and everything but you have the same soundtrack then you only apply you only take in one soundtrack but apply in different com compositions so the file in the end would be the same also what you can do nowadays what might be helpful for you if you're actually doing TCPs as an independent filmmaker is that sometimes the festivals don't send the hard disks back so you have the possibility to split up the DCP over multiple uh, volumes, so you can just burn it on Blu-rays, on two Blu-rays, and send it out, and it'll be fine. So it's just cheaper, and they can ingest it usually, and put the, it's just if they copy the folders back together, or just one disk at a time, they can ingest in all the servers as well. Yeah. But this is kind of making simple things complicated. Usually it's just easier to play the hun pay the 150 slots for the disk and be sure that it works. Show details. No soundtrack. Well, we're happy with this. Uh, presentation, render, new folder. Alright. Fortunately, this is short, so it should go fast. Actually, uh, first of all, a very good way to work with sync sound, meaning most sound studios know how to deal with 23976, but they have no clue how to deal with 24.00. Second is that um, this is exactly the format for Blu-ray, so it's usually either one or the other. But why 24 and 23976? Why I choose 23976 if I have other formats than TCP? Is that you can have uh, Blu-ray discs just as one eye for screeners, for preview purposes, you can have all video formats. Even standard definition NTCS video will support 23.976 over 3 to 2 pull down, while 24.00 would be just impossible. Mm -hmm. There's no video format actually for 24.00. And that's mm -hmm. why the 23.976 makes the most sense unless you're making only for TCP. If you're making only for TCP, I would recommend just having telling the sound recorders that you will have the time code 24.00 and then you can just keep your entire workflow 24.00 but you have to remember you cannot make any video outputs out of this, any standard video outputs like HD cam, mm. anything like this. I see. Only HD cam SR supports 24.00. All right, success, my friends. Well, we don't really need to save it, so that's okay. <clears throat> I do need to read it, though. So, for watching things, EDCP player, another, not exactly a cheap tool. Uh, I don't know how many of you... No, thanks. I wonder how can I get it back to my main screen if I... Open this up. Hello. Select. Lovely. Well, here are all the 3D modes, but the window is off the screen. What kind of graphic card is this? Uh, I have NVIDIA GTX 680 <laughs> but alright well the good thing is this that um, there's actually other option stereoscopic player that will play unencrypted TCP so whenever you use a free tool because I don't know that any free tool would actually support the encryption then you can use stereoscopic player to check what you're doing so let's give it a try this is again something that I heard just a few weeks ago that stereoscopic player does play DCP, so I haven't tried this. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It 
doesn't seem to be playing it back real time. Whatever that means. Like this? Or what? I, I lost it. You should have to set up the option inside the stereoscope. Mm. Yes? File? Yes? File? Uh, settings, usually. Yeah. Lower. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Advanced edition. Down. 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 This. Add it. Third tab. Add it. And here. Okay, this is the coding resolution. Over resolution. So you can put it half at the. Ah, it's just the speed. Okay, got it. Reduce speed and late, okay. And this also half because we're actually off shoot. The video must be reloaded, okay. Well we can do that. Okay. <laughs> Getting back to them. Um, first of all, people who know Vegas, do does it support frame frame sequences? Frame right. sequ yeah. What do you mean by frame sequences? JPEGs. JPEG frame yeah. sequence. All right. I think yeah. We think yes. So we we shall know for sure soon enough. So Sony. You can render out frame sequences. Yeah, but can I put them back in as a sequence? That's the question. Okay. As I told you before, one way to find out. So we had this. Pull in the left. It does show length. No, still. On the left. A range. Yeah. Opens it. Oh, lovely. Mm -hmm. But what will be the frame rate? I wonder. Twenty-four. Not twenty-three nine seven six. Ah, but you can choose. Lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Progressive. Now, somebody still smarter than I am would actually tell me if I get two streams. Ah, there was a possibility to mock yeah. them somehow, if I remember correctly. It's been a while since I used Vegas. So It's a, a if fact. You, yeah, if you help me a little bit with this, we get it done faster. Open it. Just let's finish first pulling things in. Uh, and at the end you had there the 3D mode. Create a new track. Yeah, select both of the clips. Just one second, let's make sure that we are in 3D mode in the first place. We're no, no, we're not. Now, very important in Vegas, there's like what we were looking before in Premiere Pro where we could just click in interpret footage and type in the frame rate. Vegas doesn't have anything like this. What you can do is read timing but this will end up with some sort of weird blended frames all over the place. So I found out either to use the still frames or to make this Cineform file already from Premiere Pro at the right frame rate and then pull it back into the Vegas. It's the only way to actually get the clean Blu-ray. But it needs to be 23, 9, 7, 6 and no other frame rate. Otherwise you end up all with blended frames because the last moment when you render it out for Blu-ray, it will automatically render to 23, 9, 7, 6 by just blending frames however it feels pleasing by keeping the audio file length the correct. You have upper field first, right, up, up uh, right thank you. Apply, all right. So then now se select. select both of them uh, and okay. right click on one. Select they are the no, not selected. Select. Only one select. No shift. Yeah, right click. Maybe I should do <laughs> just in case like this. Um, up, 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 up. Bear stereoscopic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And you can play with play with the convergence, yes. etc. This I already know. But now, can somebody tell me a good way to make sure that the left and the right tie are still correct? Maybe just put the analog glasses on for a second, one way or the other. It's correct? It is. All right. 
So if you would have an audio, put the audio under it. And markers, if you use markers, they would should show up as chapters. I think. You have to set up a chapter marker. marker. You can insert. Wasn't well, there any settings on the marker? Double click the, the icon. I'm trying for the love of God. Uh, double clicking doesn't do much for it. Rename. Rename, alright. One. But I think they will actually show up in a Blu ray player as we don't have here one. It's not really a problem. So, option. No, it wasn't there. Tools. tools. Burn disk. Blu ray disk. This is your choice. As this is running in demo mode, I can't take Sony, I can't take the AC3 Pro, it just will tell me that. No good. And the only way you can be sure that you're actually doing stereo is that it shows you two streams. So if you in your project setting, go back to your project setting and at some point just uh, put it off, then it will show up as mono. And here you can still make sure. So you just. Anyways, my workflow usually is that I first make the ISO file, test it with a software player that it like works, or any PlayStation, and then actually burn the disk. But you can do it straight and then work, walk up to... But always, it's something that was very common with DVDs, especially interlaced DVDs. Always have one player to check these things. Uh, my recommendation is go buy the cheapest hardware player from, the, from your local shop, uh, go to... Saturn, for example, you'll find one that's actually cheaper than the software. So let's put it under render again. And let's call it the big art. Big 3D art. And 